Hello and welcome to PS on Air, which is where columnists of Project Syndicate engage with the newspapers that publish their articles. My name is John Andrews. I'm a contributor to Project Syndicate myself, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Leonard, who is the director of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And from the press, we have Leonardo Mesano, who is the London correspondent of Milan's leading financial daily, Il Sole 24 Ore. And we also have Slavomir Siakowski, who is the editor of the Warsaw-based Kritika Politichna, or Political Critique in English. Mark Leonard, welcome. Uh, we live in what the Chinese call interesting times. I, we're cursed, perhaps. <laughs> and obviously, the, sort of the big I suppose, event of the last few months has been the rise of Donald Trump, culminating in his election as the new president of the United States. Uh, what do you fear, what do you hope, what do you expect from Trump's foreign policy? I fear that Trump is going to make the United States uh, into the biggest source of disorder on the world stage. And I think there are three main reasons for that. Firstly, because he <clears throat> is questioning American security guarantees. He said that he won't defend NATO countries if they don't defend themselves. He's told Japan and Korea to get nuclear weapons. He's told Saudi Arabia that they can pay for their own security. So that means in the three big theatres in the Middle East, in wider Europe and in East Asia. We're likely to see arms races as uh, American allies hedge against uh, being abandoned by the United States and rivals probe America. I mean, he had a point, though, on NATO's expense, uh, defense spending, didn't he? Uh, well, absolutely. And, and in one sense, what he's saying is nothing new. President Obama, President Bush, every American president since the end of the Cold War has said that Europeans need to do more to defend themselves. But what he did was he's raised questions about whether the US will back countries. So that's the first kind of big source. The second kind of thing which is worrying is that he seems to be the first president uh, in a long time who doesn't think that the liberal order which the United States created serves America's interests. So he's talked about renegotiating everything uh, from the World Trade Organization and NAFCA to the Iran nuclear deal to uh, the climate deal. And if you try and introduce the art of the deal into all the institutions of the global order, that is going to create a lot of chaos and uh, will encourage other people to do the same thing. And finally, he is uh, also trying to reshuffle all of his relationships with different uh, powers and if he does what he said he's going to do towards Russia that will put uh, Europeans in an intolerable position of having to play the, the sort of bad cop t to America's good cop and it's That's, a very confusing. It's a very good point but you haven't, I'm a bit surprised you haven't mentioned China and I mean well, America has had the, the one child, the, the one child, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the one China policy for so many years now, so many decades and yet I know he's welcomed uh, Tsai Ing-wen from Taiwan uh, etc. Uh, is that in a way perhaps the biggest fear? Well, I think that it, it is uh, part of the, the, the picture that he's trying to do a sort of reverse Nixon and cozy up to Russia in order to contain China and he sees, obviously sees China as the real geopolitical rival. I mean the Chinese so far have been handling this in quite a cool and collected way and in some ways uh, a lot of Chinese uh, experts were secretly willing Trump to win the, the presidency because they, they w can see that he is going to create a lot of havoc for China's rivals in the region, particularly Japan and, yeah. and, and South Korea. But that is uh, maybe potentially the, the most frightening thing, the, the, you know, because if you look around the world, the one part of the world where you could have a real great power war is East Asia. Absolutely. But going back to Europe, I mean, uh, you're from Europe, some of you, you're from Europe, you're from Poland. I mean, presumably the whole thing on NATO and the relationship between Trump's America and Putin's Russia is something which, you know, is of immediate interest to you. Uh, well, when I'm looking on contemporary Polish authorities, I'm not so sure if I'm still in Europe. But uh, but true, like, uh, you can afford Brexit, more or less. It's going to be, you know, it's going to cost some cost. It's going to cost some cost in America to have Trump but you still can afford it, okay? Uh, do we uh, 
but can we afford Trump and can we afford Brexit and all this disintegration, destabilization and rising of populist powers that usually are very pro-Russian and usually cause uh, troubles to what saved us because Polish independence really belongs to geopolitics, not really to solidarity, John Pope II and like many myths that we used to believe. Yeah. What can be the consequence for my country? I mean, I think it is a, it's, it's a very scary moment when you have all of these tectonic plates which are shifting. And if you look at the state of, of Europe at the moment, it's, it's not encouraging because there was this incredible, surprising consensus around containing Russia after the annexation of Crimea with sanctions being brought in. And that now looks like it's going to be put under enormous pressure. If Donald Trump does what he says he's going to do and recognizes the uh, okay. annexation of Crimea, I, who knows what Donald Trump's going to do? <laughs> you, you, you must know. You're the, you know you're <laughs> I have a secret portal into Donald Trump's <laughs> brain. Leonardo, what, what do you think? <laughs> I, and I'm curious to, to understand which is what do you think instead about this special Anglo uh, American relationship? No? that has been at the center of the transatlantic relationship for so long time. Now, Trump may, how do you see them? Well, it's very funny because on the one hand, you know, there is this feeling, particularly amongst people who supported the Brexit, that Donald Trump is an enormous, ble he's manna from heaven for the Brexit yeah. cloud because Britain's going to go from being at the back of the queue to the front of the queue. Yeah. He's going to sign a global tra a trade deal with the UK. Um, Britain's suddenly going to become yeah. important again. But on the other hand, all of the things that underpin the special relationship, which was the idea of a global open trade order, which was a British project and then became an American project, the idea of a European security order where you balanced other yeah. powers and stopped anyone controlling it, he's walking back from. So yeah. I don't know what content there is. You know, it might be that they get on really well. well Mark, but, you, I mean, yeah. Are you arguing really that the, the idea of the West itself is over? Absolutely. I mean, I think the West has been, uh, you know, in, in the balance since the end of the Cold War, because the big external threat which drove us together was uh, disappeared. And a lot of the tensions across yeah, the Atlantic... There were several decades of complacency. I mean, Fukuyama with, you know, the end of history, etc. We thought that Western neoliberalism had conquered everything. Absolutely. No, I mean, I think there was an incredible period from... Uh, 1989 till 2008, where there was a, a sort of uh, revolutionary wave where this mix of free markets, elections, and uh, a kind of different idea of, of foreign policy organization seemed to be sweeping the world. And we, yeah. particularly in Europe, we saw, uh, you know, country after country throw off their old ways of working and join the European Union. And we kind of universalized that. And we thought it was the end of history because Europe was being changed. But in fact, with hindsight, we can see it was just Europe that was going through that yeah, process. It would be my question to you, Mark, because what is scary, we all know. But how to oppose it, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it is a real question because what we're seeing, I think you saw a revolution after 1989 with countries going through the sort of changes that you were talking about. And now what we're seeing is a counter-revolution. And uh, it's difficult to know whether the counter-revolution is going to overturn the revolution or if it will end up actually legitimating it. You know, in a way, it was communism and socialism that saved capitalism and free trade by... Uh, making it more legitimate and by creating a, a basis where the majority of the populations could actually embrace it. I think the, the challenge now is to see whether some of the energy which is embodied by Trump, by Marine Le Pen, by UKIP, by the Five Star Movement in Italy, that anger and that frustration with uh, a lot of the things which... Uh, went along with the, 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 the progress of the post-Cold War period uh, can be harnessed to, to debug the system so that it ends up being more legitimate at the end of it. Um, and that is, you know, it's, it's too early to tell whether 
uh, what we're going to see is a complete overthrow of the system. Some things look pretty difficult to reverse. The Brexit, actually, in many ways, is more irreversible than Trump. I mean, there'll yeah. be another election in four years' time if the world survives. Uh, <laughs> another president might act differently. How do you, how do you rate uh, the role played by the media in this uh, fake news that have been uh, floating around uh, uh, as an engine behind uh, the populist movement, both in Europe and in the US? And I think that, you know, what we've seen is nothing less than uh, a complete uh, dislocation of, of all of the political institutions, from the media to political parties, to the, the ways that we kind of organize uh, our debates and discussion about what's uh, happening in the world, and the rejection of the mainstream media is similar to the rejection of the mainstream political parties that defined our democracies for the last few decades. And, Do um, you agree, Slavomir? Because it seems to me that actually I mean, there's much more fake news in the United States than there was has been in Italy, for example. I don't know about Poland. Or well, unfortunately, we, as always, are the or we would like to be the 51st state of the United States. Uh, <laughs> and if at least in this case, we are. Like, fake news, of course, are everywhere. And we live also in the era of post-truth. Uh, well, m mainstream became unelectable everywhere. And, of course, like, uh, both for parties and for for media. But I'm thinking, like, how we can fight with this post-truth uh, era? Because I don't believe the truth can be the answer of post-truth. If it would be, then, well, we wouldn't live in the era of post-truth. So what do you think? Like, we should uh, overcome it being more powerful, more harsh, Be having less, less democratic. scrupulous? <laughs> like, or what should we do? I mean, I, I do think that uh, part of the challenge for us is to understand how divided different societies are. So if you look at all the countries that I'm familiar with, you have an almost 50-50 split, which is quite profound. My worry is that there's been a sort of doubling down um, of, on that divide. So Hillary Clinton's campaign in the US was very much about appealing to all of the groups who felt that they'd been disenfranchised from the future, but were part of this emerging democratic majority. And if you appeal to all of these different minorities in that way, it's not that surprising that you get a counter mobilization from, from the kind of white working classes who feel like they're disenfranchised. With regards to that we were yesterday's speech of Theresa May, was it the country or the party which was the priority? Oh, it's always been the party. I mean, there's a very clear hierarchy of interest for Theresa May, and it's not that different from the hierarchy for David Cameron. Yeah. So number one is the unity of the Conservative Party. And then number two is her long-term obsession, which is just reducing the number of foreigners coming into the, into the UK. Then uh, there is a question about uh, taking back control and escaping the clutches of the mm. European Court of Justice. And only after that do you get worried about things like economic yeah. benefits. And then, you know, if there's any time left at all, there was about one paragraph on, on foreign policy, cooperation, the security order mm -hmm. and the other issues that we were talking about in that speech. And it does show the extent to which there's been a kind of shrinking of mm -hmm. the, the horizons in the UK. This country that, you know, 200 years ago created globalization <laughs> through empire and industry that kind of spread the world is now uh, obsessed with the micro politics of the governing party and has got almost no bandwidth for anything else. But do you believe that the, the threat, if you want to call it in this way, that uh, Theresa May showed yesterday is sustainable? So do you think this country, the UK, has the ability to sustain some sort of fiscal dumping or, uh, you know, trade war with, with Europe? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, there was a huge contradiction between the different goals that Theresa May set out because she said that she wanted to make Britain stronger, more united, more equal and more open to the world. And uh, it seemed like a strange way of doing it. You know, we're drawing from the single market to, and shrinking the British economy. Um, creating a constitutional crisis yeah. with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, threatening social mm. dumping mm. Uh, doesn't necessarily make it more equal. 
and then more open to the world. It's a bit exactly. odd if you look at the way that Britain seems to be walking away from some quite long standing bits of European foreign policy. So, you know, uh, she was attacking the two state solution, which was one of her things that people are wondering whether Britain's going to stand up for the Iran nuclear deal, yeah. which it tried to invest in. So it is a bit uh, uh, difficult to see how uh, the detail of our policy delivers on the slogan. I have a question about some hidden, um, I don't know how to put it, but uh, worrying danger um, in the speech of Theresa May when she was like suggesting that if we will not find a good solution for the London city, we can uh, turn Great Britain to be a tax haven uh, neighboring European Union. Yeah. Is it possible or is it the real aim or it's just, uh, you know, bargaining? Well, I think it's, you know, all sorts of things are possible. And after 2016, I'm very reluctant to, to make any <laughs> predictions with great, with great certainty. But it seems uh, slightly contradictory on the one hand to, to look at the things which were driving the 52 percent who voted for Brexit, which were a lot of concerns about high levels of immigration, about inequality, about being left behind by globalization. Uh, and then um, the idea of, of trying to turn Britain into Singapore on steroids, which some yeah. Brexiteers wanted, where you have a, a kind of very low tax economy that lets people basically fend for themselves. Yeah, but your point is quite well taken. It's very difficult to imagine Britain regardless whether it's in the United Kingdom as it exists or, mm. or minus smaller, Scotland or England. whatever. It's difficult <laughs> to imagine the UK as, a, as Singapore on steroids. It really is. Yeah. But Slavomir, uh, I mean, if you think in terms of, of Brexit, I mean, surely Poland really is likely to suffer the most from any uh, restrictions on migration. Remember, we are also worse off yeah. uh, the fact that so many people and so many young and you know, healthy, sure. strong people immigrated. So, well, I was, I'm not sure about it, and, but I don't see many people willing to go. Uh, and anyway, anyway, they can also go to Germany, they can go to America again, or well, I'm not that sure now, it's a good tourist yeah. destination now. But anyway, like, um, I'm not sure that Poland, Poland can be like uh, uh, worse off, uh, from the fact that it's disintegrating Europe strongly, yeah. m creating a chaos, making Europe weaker vis-a-vis -vis Russia also. So th th this is scary to me. Bernardo, do you have a last question on Brexit to, to Mark? Yesterday, Theresa May showed, you know, presented a plan that goes beyond uh, what, in a way, was the other surprise of her speech. So we have to reshape the country and re decide which is the new, you know, the new future for the UK. How do you see it? I, I mean, I find the UK uh, to be going through this really, really profound identity crisis. Yeah. When Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, she incarnated a certain idea of Englishness, particularly English nationalism. And there was, she defined England against the rest of the world. They were kind of enemies outside, get General Gautieri, the Soviet yeah. Union, and then enemies within, the miners, yeah. left-wing professions, etc., and ethnic minorities. Yeah. And then Tony Blair and David Cameron basically reinvented what Britishness meant, and they moved from a kind of ethnic, religious, white kind of post-imperial identity into a more civic mm. identity that celebrated values and creativity, which was yeah. quite open to the world. And that empowered a large number of people, and they suddenly felt British again. Mm. And then the people who had felt British under Margaret Thatcher suddenly felt that they were the kind of disempowered minority. Yeah. And the Brexit vote was the revenge of yeah the uh, people who think of themselves as a majority but fear that they're becoming a minority. And there is this sort of civil war now going on between the 52% and the 48% yeah. to define what the future of Britain is. And Theresa May, even though she was on the Remain side, is, is acting as the kind of tribune of the 52% of the yeah. and is threatening to bring the party backwards uh, and the country backwards to, to a kind of earlier identity. But I'm not sure it, it's actually viable in the sort of world but that we're living in. the projection in the world, where is it? Today, some, some European newspapers said uh, Little England is back. I'm not so sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it, is, um, it is difficult to see ha where 
there's any room even for the rest of the world because there, there is so much solipsism. I mean, we're in a, this kind of navel gazing yeah. period where national, uh, where mm. foreign policy becomes almost a kind of yeah. uh, a form of identity politics. It's not really about changing the world. It's yeah. more about who, uh, defining who we are but ourselves. Looking ahead, we're going to have elections for French president in two, three months' time. We're going to have uh, Bundestag elections in the, in the fall. Netherlands. Uh, we've got the Netherlands election before that. Italy. Uh, Italy. Will the wave of populism keep going on or, or, or has it broken? Will the tide, to mix my metaphor, start receding? Yeah. You have to, this, is, this is your big gamble now, Fark. I think it's still got quite a lot of uh, 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 the, the wave still got quite a lot of energy in it and will, it will sort of carry on moving forward either because populists are going to win in, in these different elections or because the mainstream elites fear that the only way that they can challenge it is by channeling those forces themselves and that's what we're seeing with Theresa May and I think Francois Fillon if he gets elected um, is going to be elected on a populist anti-Muslim wave rather than acting as a kind of uh, barrier to it. And that is definitely, I think, going to be the big story of 2017 as a continuation of, of that wave. I don't know whether it will break because other people adapt to it and find ways of channeling that energy into reformist projects which can uh, help to sustain the, the institutions of the European Union and the liberal order, or because it's such a catastrophe when Donald Trump gets into power that people... Oh, we will see. I think we are <laughs> condemned to be living in interesting times for a, a few more months yet. Uh, Mark Leonard, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you very much for being with us on PS On Air.